we have the voice of Ring of Honor sitting here with us today. We have Ian Riccoboni. Ian, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. As of press time, we are all in the bubble, and we are here in Baltimore getting ready for the 19th anniversary. I can't believe Ring of Honor is old enough to have a full driver's license in the United States. They can purchase lottery tickets. Oh. <laughs> they can, you know, they well, we're, we're, over here in Canada. Yeah, we're here in Canada, so we, we, we can give our OH a beer now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Probably Molson, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian, I'm glad you mentioned the ROH bubble because it's definitely something I, I want to touch base on really quick. I love the fact that all you guys are using that hashtag ROH bubble. I just think it sends such a great message about the measures the company is taking for everyone's safety. Can you take us inside the bubble a little bit? Just uh, you know, let us know how you're doing in there and uh, what you're doing to kind of keep saying. Absolutely. So I am, like you said, Ring of Honor spared no expense to do the best they can to have all of our not only wrestlers, but but video, lighting, sound crew, um, all within the same hotel. And what that means is uh, the Maryland State Athletic Commission is able to know where we are, what we're doing, know our health protocols. So on an average bubble trip, we get tested three times early in the pandemic. It was four. And uh, it was we do we do a test at home uh, to measure and see if anybody has COVID before coming traveling all the way to Baltimore. So that protocol has resulted in no spread, knock on wood, of coronavirus, COVID-19 within ROH tapings. Um, if somebody does have to, you know, it does have coronavirus or COVID, they, they are asked to stay at home. They're still paid. They're still taken care of. Um, there's additional health resources provided, I believe. So it's one of these things where we're, you know, Ring of Honor, we took a pause during the summer, but we are doing it, I think, the best out of any major organization. We have a, a policy and we're sticking to it. And it doesn't matter if you are you know, a lighting grip, or if you are a main event wrestler, you know, we want to make sure you're safe and that you can arrive to Baltimore in good health and that we do our best to have you leave Baltimore in good health. So, you know, in the bubble, we, uh, we can schedule some gym time and that's about it. <laughs> we, we leave our room for the COVID tests and we can leave to go run or work out, uh, that sort of thing. But otherwise, you know, they, they give us a generous per diem that we can purchase food and have it delivered. Uh, Jimmy Seafood here in Baltimore has made some deliveries for us as well. So it's it's a nice environment. It's a fun environment. Um, I like it because I bring my PlayStation. I brought my PlayStation 4 and I I play NBA 2K pretty much year round. So I'm a big NBA guy. And there's some things in the game that you really have to play a lot to achieve and i have two little ones at home so i don't get to do that at home so when i come, when I come to the bubble you know 16 straight hours of nba 2k sign me up and uh i'm, I'm just as caught up as some of these hardcore gamers are. so I, I try and keep busy i watch you know i watch a lot of youtube i'm into you know the mini walt disney world and disneyland documentaries uh, there's some fun, you know, 20 minute documentaries that are professionally done. These guys on YouTube now are so good. The, these professional quality, you know, mini documentaries are out there. And, uh, I watch a lot of those and, uh, I binge watched report of the week last night. Who's uh, a guy, kind of a skinny guy who reviews fast food and, okay. uh, and he's got millions of subscribers and he's just this super interesting dude. <laughs> he's just kind of this, uh, you know, this this kind of thin, really rail thin man that eats thousands and thousands of calories worth of fast food and uh, grades on a scale of 10. And he's got millions of followers. And I've been uh, I'm, I'm late to the party on him, but I'm really enjoying his videos. Well, it sounds like anybody that's playing uh, NBA 2K better stay away from you. If you're playing online, you'll be dropping threes <laughs> on them all night. eh? Oh, no, no. So I, I'm the worst. So I do. all. <laughs> <laughs> so there are specific modes where Tyler, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, before you go on, I, uh, since Ian's talking about the safety and all that, and every on all the precautions that our ROH is, uh, has been making, I want to ask a quick question. Ian, knowing all the precautions that you and your team and ROH is taking, 
do you does it bother you at all to see you know WWE planning to do WrestleMania with a seventy five percent attendance and to, to see uh, AEW have small crowds in, or is it tr- just kind of a you know let them do what they're doing, let us do what we are doing? Or does it bother you to see to see big companies do that? Yeah, I, I'm somebody that I I have asthma. I um, I have a couple other kind of co-conditions and I I have folks in my family, you know, my brother had a heart attack when he was 31. And I think about him who, you know, after his heart attack, he ran half marathons. He he completed a full marathon uh, when he turned 40. And this is a guy that, you know, his whole life was, was very overweight and he had a heart attack and it woke him up. But I think about people like him that who have worn down bodies on the inside that you might not be able to tell from the outside. And that's the scariest part for me about COVID is that, you know, I could carry it or somebody that is a little bit worn down could carry it and pass it on to somebody that, you know, may be very susceptible to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I am very cautious in my personal behavior. I'm, you know, I, I pretty much go to the grocery store and sometimes target and sometimes target is the grocery store Mm -hmm. in some cases. So I, my personal preference is to, to do it the way ring of honor is doing it. I prefer to have no crowds at all yet. Um, you know, at the same time, the vaccine, um, I've been inoculated with the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine and I'm very hopeful. And I think that, you know, the numbers in the United States are going up in a positive way in terms of, you know, there's almost 4 million doses administered, I think, on Friday or Saturday as we're recording this. And so a lot of people are receiving at least their first dose of the vaccine. So, you know, it, it could be a smart bet. It could be a smart gambit. Um, I hope that no one gets gets sick or ill if they have the vaccine and the mask. I mean, that's that's about all you can ask for. And that should help folks return to uh, a, a more sense of normal. But, you know, I, I can't judge what I'm doing other than just say, you know, my personal preference is, is what Ring of Honor is doing right now. And that's, um, you know, having a very closed environment and having no fans. I, I'd love it more than anybody if, we had, if we'd have fans at the events. I mean, before, before we paused, uh, you know, we had Free Enterprise in Baltimore that had, uh, you know, almost 3,000 people. And then we had a, a nice big number in Nashville. And then we had our highest attendance ever in St. Louis and that, you know, Nashville and St. Louis are paid, paid events. Um, so we were on a roll, you know, we were starting to pick up some steam and some momentum. Definitely and, were, yeah. and I just, I love where we we're headed. We had some big matches signed, but you know, it, you just have to go with the reality of the situation. I think the reality right now, it's best to keep people safe and have them enjoy our product on TV and pay-per-view. Well, we got to uh, tip our cap to ring of honor for putting everyone's safety ahead. Uh, you know, um, just awesome stuff that they're doing. Um, let's kind of get ahead a little bit here and let's, let's talk about some business that's going on in ring of honor though. You guys are celebrating your 19th anniversary on pay-per-view Friday, March the 26th. What a card is being put together here. And, and I can't think of a better uh, fitting individual on your roster to be challenging for the world title than Jay lethal. How important is a guy like Jay lethal to your company and how fitting is it that he's in this main event spot challenging for the world title on this event? Yeah, it was at the 15th anniversary in Las Vegas where I just I accidentally dubbed him the franchise and it just kind of flew out of my mouth. And I, I, Colt was saying something and I chimed in. I said, yeah, he's the centerpiece. He's the franchise player of Ring of Honor because he's the guy that is our connection. You know, he and the Briscoes are the guys that are our connection th- to our history. You know, he started wrestling in Ring of Honor when he was 18 years old. And he was taken under Samoa Joe's wing when he was when he was 19. And so he's a guy that is written and his stories written throughout our history. He's a link to the pure title. He was an original one of the original pure champions. Mm -hmm. And he's a guy that you can count on to deliver in, in big spot after big spot. And he's really doesn't like what LFI is doing right now. He doesn't like the fact that they're arrogant. He doesn't like the fact that they're disrespecting the ring of honor. And so, you know, to have a guy kind of stand up for sort of the pure rules, the pure way of wrestling, it's exciting that it is the franchise. And he's a guy that is not only reliable, but is always learning. I mean, I remember one time on, on a bus in England 
I, I pulled up a clip of Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer doing this just snap power slam. This, and he said, can I see that? And then later that night, he did it. And he's just that kind of guy that can see something once. He's In music, they call it sight reading, where you can you can just see a piece of music and, and pick it up and play it. Uh, he's a guy that can incorporate anything just by seeing it once or twice. So, I mean, he's just phenomenal. He's He's got the records for most days as television champion, most days as world champion. He's got the record for longest tag team title reign. Uh, so he's just a guy that he's over all over the record books here in Ring of Honor and uh, really can cement himself in history. The one record he doesn't have is he's not one of the, the three-time world champions, and he can change that at the 19th anniversary. Oh, absolutely. And, and another name that I want to talk to you about here is uh, a, a guy that's new to the company, and that's EC3. How big of a score is it for Ring of Honor to, sound, uh, to sign a talent the caliber of EC3? You know, he's coming off kind of a lackluster run in the WWE where a lot of people, myself included, feel that he was very misused and, and kind of lost in the shuffle. Um, do you think that he has a lot, like something to prove coming into these shows with ROH and, and a lot of motivation going into this? To show, just to show the world how talented he truly is? Absolutely. There are guys that when they come off television for different companies, not not even necessarily WWE, but when they come off of television and you have the opportunity to sign them, you can read in their eyes in about one or two seconds what their motivation is. And I remember meeting Cody for the first time when he signed with us. And you could just see that he was always thinking that he was always he's figuring out how he could be bigger and better and have a bigger presentation and be just be a bigger star. Um, when you look at EC3, he looks like a superhero. He's he's I don't even know if it's a character. I, I mean, this guy, I remember meeting him. <laughs> I remember meeting him three years ago. I was backstage at an NXT taping. Uh, Steve Carino I hadn't seen for years, so I went to go see him. He invited me back, uh, and he introduced me to Shawn Michaels and Norman Smiley, and then to EC3 and Ricochet. And I just remember meeting this guy, and he was he had a little food scale, which he was individually measuring grains of rice, because that's how important his diet was to him. <laughs> and, and he needed to know to the nutrient what he was putting in his body. And that's why he looks like the way he does. Um, but you can tell he has that spark and he's got that twinkle and that he is motivated to right wrongs or to just prove that he he is a star and can be a big time star. And so him against Jay Briscoe, I, I mean, we've seen flashes of it. There was a match that got thrown out on television. Uh, they were in a six man tag team together. Uh, they've they've fought. They've had to be and pull apart and i think it's a it's a perfect match and you know they say sometimes styles make fights and that usually refers to a clash of styles maybe like roosh or jay lethal but ec3 versus jay briscoe you got two guys that are just going to hit and hit hard and i'm excited to call that one i couldn't agree more and it's almost like you know they say things happen for a reason because this match was supposed to happen a few months ago right Mm -hmm. um, and, and then EC3, um, unfortunately, wasn't able to make that match, and we ended up getting uh, Briscoe versus Taylor. Um, and at the time, of course, as a fan, I was disappointed. I really wanted to see that match, but for it to happen at the 19th anniversary, that's something really special. So it's almost like fate had something to do with this. How how special do you think it is for like, like you? Obviously, have talked to these guys. These guys come going into the, this 19th anniversary. Is there is there like a, I, I hate to throw it to a different company, but is there a WrestleMania feel to to this show for these guys? Yeah, yeah. It's you know the anniversary is always one of the biggest events, and if final battle is the conclusion of of the year, and it usually wraps up feuds, and there's usually you know these big time grudge matches or title matches. The anniversary show usually sets the stage and is usually the event we look to every year to see, okay, what's going to happen in 2021? Who's going to make their mark? Who's going to jump off the page? And it's an exciting event in that perspective because, you know, usually for, for the, for the WWE, that's traditionally been maybe the Royal rumble where they have kind of a shorter period where you watch the Royal rumble and you say, okay, what's going to be the WrestleMania matches coming out of this. For us, you know, Ring of Honor, we don't have the luxury of having the amount of TV time that 
that WWE does or even um, AEW. So our story, our stories burn a little bit longer. And so what you see at the anniversary is usually sets the table for most of the year, at least through best in the world. And so I'm really excited because, you know, these types of events, you know, you usually have big time matches, uh, but also ones that that plant seeds and, and kind of weave threads together through the rest of the year. So for us, I mean, I love the anniversary. It was, it's going to be my fourth anniversary as the uh, announcer on pay-per-view for Ring of Honor. Um, you know, my first one was in Vegas. I, I love going to Vegas because we'd be in Sam's Town and Sam's Town's this, you know, little dinky casino uh, in North Vegas kind of out of the way that the killers sing about and i'm a big killers fan so it was cool to be out there and uh you know it, it's just this fun time where you get to see everybody but you know here the atmosphere it, it's like seeing your best friends you haven't seen in a couple of months you know and and me and caprice and todd sinclair and bobby cruz and joe mandak we're probably the only five guys that get to see literally everybody at some point and so right. I really appreciate that because, you know, it's it's that nice feeling of camaraderie. So if anything, you know, everybody does get, you know, jacked up and jammed up. But uh, I really like the camaraderie and being able to see everybody a little bit, at least, you know, once every two months and hopefully hopefully sooner. You know, hopefully the vaccine and, you know, the you know, the uh, hopefully we get the cases down, the vaccine, the masks continue and, and we all stay healthy and maybe we can expedite things. Absolutely. It's so it's so funny to me that you say that you that you don't have the luxury for 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 that because for what you consider not the luxury is the reason I'm a Ring of Honor fan. I am I'm 40 years old. I've been watching wrestling for 35 years. I the reason I got into it was the long burn. I like the long storylines which doesn't happen anymore. WWE, AEW, they don't know how to do that. Ring of Honor can do that. And you say, you know, we don't have the luxury of the long TV times. I can't sit down on a Monday night and watch three hours of wrestling. I have a two-year-old. I, I, I'm, i you know, I can't do it. Can I sit down on a Monday night and watch one hour of phenomenal, even if it's two matches, phenomenal wrestling matches on Ring of Honor? You're damn right I can. So if anybody has a luxury here, it's Ring of Honor in, in my mind as a fan because I can't can't watch a pay-per-view length tv show every monday i can watch ring of honor i you know and i appreciate that and i never i hadn't seen that point of view until i myself became a dad and your time your time your time's the one thing that you cannot replace you can buy more stuff whatever stuff you like you can buy it you can buy i collect some basketball cards i collect some wrestling memorabilia i can buy more or i can sell more and i I can buy more food. I can buy a, a TV. I can buy, you know, I can buy a car, or save up for a house or something, right? You can't buy more time. And so there is an advantage in that our product is, I don't want to say easy to follow, but it, it is, you know, it broadcasts free in the United States. Um, if you can't, if you don't have a local affiliate that carries it, and right now I think we cover, you know, 75% of the country between the Sinclair affiliates and the Fox Sports Valley sports stations and stadium and, and all that fun stuff. You know, you can always go online, fight TV carries it. Um, you know, ROH wrestling.com carries it. So there's always a way to watch it and you can watch it sort of on your own time. And there, you know, the, it has its benefits because we do, you know, four hours of television a week. We have week by week, which usually has some lighthearted stuff on YouTube, sometimes an exclusive match. And, you know, everything counts in Ring of Honor because the matches are so limited. There is not a single thing that is done just to be done. Every every result matters. A win, a loss, everything matters. So, you know, to me, uh, you're right. You know, it's it's one of those things where I'd like to have a little bit more time to showcase some of the younger guys. But at the same time, it's uh, it, it makes it easy to follow. And, and you, you really, you know, there's no excuse not to, not to have that amount of time, you know? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what both you guys are saying there. And, and one thing that I think Ring of Honor does a great job of is really cramming a lot into that hour without making you feel overwhelmed. You know, if you take a look at this card from top to bottom that you guys are building for the anniversary show, um, it, it's a stack card and everything has a story to it. What are some of the matches that you're looking forward to on this show personally, Ian? 
Well, I'm looking forward to Mexico Squad versus Shane Taylor Promotions. Um, Shane mm-hmm. Taylor is firing on all cylinders. I think Shane Taylor is the complete package. I think he is a guy that has gotten slept on for too long. And I think he's going to open some eyes and has opened some eyes in the last couple of weeks. He's pinned Jay Lethal. He's pinned Jay Briscoe. He's pinned Kenny King. And I think he had a shot at pinning Roosh, had Kenny King come out with the chair. So uh, Shane Taylor Promotions, they're doing a pretty honorable thing. Online, they said they're giving they're giving Mexico Squad a shot because, you know what, Mexico Squad is a little rusty. Bandito hadn't wrestled in almost a year. Uh, Flamita hadn't wrestled in almost a year. So they're giving them a rematch, and they're doing it at the at the pay per view. And so for me, you know, Mexico Squad, they have one match under their belts. They're ready. They're ready to come back and wrestle. You know, I'm excited to see that match, and that's something that that I'm going to look forward to as well. Um, Jonathan Gresham still has a question mark by his opponent, but Dak Draper has reeled off win after win after win. Uh, you got to think it's either him or maybe Josh Woods or Dalton Castle. I'm mm-hmm. excited to see Jonathan Gresham defend the, you know, the pure championship. And, uh, you know, that should be a phenomenal encounter no matter who he faces. Cause it's always so interesting to see Gresham dissect his opponents. That's one of my favorite, favorite things. It doesn't matter if he's facing a guy that's, you know, five foot four, or if he's facing a guy that's, you know, six foot seven, I'm excited to see what happens there. And, uh, you know, the TV title, Tracy Williams has been knocking on the door at that television championship since he's arrived in ring of honor. And I think Tracy's got an opportunity, you know, to go in and, and win not only the TV title, but it was just announced that, that he and Rhett Titus will be competing for the tag team titles as well. So I'm super excited for Tracy Williams to see what he could do. Uh, it's going to be either a great night of celebration for him, or it's going to be the most disappointing night he's ever had. So We'll see, you know, we'll see how he and Dragon Lee, who are paired up in both of those matches, you know, how how they end up uh, coming through in the end. Oh, absolutely. And again, you guys got to tune in live on pay-per-view to see that on March of 26. I want to ask you kind of a similar question, but I want to take it one step further here. You know, with it being the 19th anniversary and, you know, you're you're um, a very knowledgeable wrestling fan. What are some of your favorite Ring of Honor moments, your personal favorite Ring of Honor moments in, in company history, whether they involve you, whether they don't involve you, uh, just some of your own personal uh, favorite moments? My favorite moments. Oh, good question. Um, the first event my little guy, Zach, ever went to, and I can't believe it, he's four already. Uh, he was less than a year old, and he came to Lakeland. Uh, he and my wife came down. And they were there for Super Card of Honor against uh, the main event was the Hardy Boys versus the Young Bucks and in a ladder match. And that was a match that I had heard whispers that might happen. But until it got in the ring, I, I just almost didn't believe it. You know, that's a dream match. And I, I got to call that one. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite moments. Um, I think, you know, one of my favorite, favorite moments that I don't think I've ever talked about. We were in Collinsville, Illinois which is across the river from St. Louis. So it's right by St. Louis. And I was calling only my second event as a, as a commentator. This is before I took over for Kevin Kelly. I was calling it with Mr. Wrestling three and his voice just completely gave out. He had laryngitis or something and he just couldn't talk. And so <laughs> I just remember, I, you know, hitting the, hitting the cough button and trying to talk to him. I'm like, do you have anything? Do you have anything left? Do you, have anything? <laughs> you know, how are you doing? And he was waving at me. And, you know, at one point they, they sent BJ Whitmer out in between matches to try and give him tea. And, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we had to do a little spiel. It, that didn't make the DVD, of course. <laughs> but at, <laughs> at, at the time we were, you know, we, for non-televised or non-TV tapings, we only brought, uh, an audio set that didn't have two-way communication. So we could be talked to, but we couldn't communicate back. So oh. we, were, we were just kind of out on an island. And uh, <laughs> poor, Steve, poor Steve. Oh, sorry. I mean, Mr. Wrestling 3. Uh, <laughs> his voice, uh, the very prominent Canadian under the mask uh, from, uh, I believe, is he from Alberta? No, he's I, from... Uh, Saskatchewan area, maybe? Saskatchewan, yeah. Maybe? Maybe. Very, yeah, very prominent Canadian was under the mask and uh, he just had nothing in his voice, maybe less than nothing. And uh, that was my, my, that was my welcome to Ring of Honor moment. Yeah, they got thrown right in the deep end on that one, eh? 
I am so happy you just brought that up because that that completely leads into my next question. Uh, we are located right outside Toronto. We we are two Canadian boys, uh, big fans. That's going to come up again in a bit when I uh, when I talk about Summer Supercard in uh, 2019. Uh, but my question for you: you you've been around uh, ROH now since 2013. You've seen a lot of things. Uh, you you know a lot of people. You may or may not know the answer to this question, but I have to ask. Um, other than a few like PCO and like Mr. Wrestling, there's very little Canadian talent in ROH. I know it's very difficult for Canadians to uh, be able to work in the States, especially indie talent. Do you have any insight of how difficult it might be to be able to sign Canadian talent? Yeah, a lot of that. A lot of that's detailed very well in Chris Jericho's second book or no, excuse mm-hmm. me, his, his first book. Um, there's actually a process with the visa. It's a visa process where if you are a Canadian citizen, uh, it is very difficult to earn money in the United States without going through the entire visa process. And that doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if you're a wrestler or if you simply want to, you know, work at the post office or work at McDonald's or work at a shopping mall or work in an office. Um, you know, you need to, have the company that you're coming to work for essentially vouch for you and go through a series of uh, interviews and paperwork. And you have to have industry experts um, essentially explain why your talent is unique and why, you know, I, I remember reading the letter Dave Meltzer wrote for Chris Jericho saying why he was such a unique talent and why he should be granted uh, a visa to work in the United States. And same thing for Lance Storm. I believe he wrote Lance Storms as well. Uh-huh. And it's a it's a long, arduous process that really, you know, a company companies the size of Ring of Honor and Impact, and I'd probably say AEW as well. Um, you know, in some ways, don't have the same resources as WWE, and so there are Canadian talent that unfortunately, you know, get left in the dark in the United States because of just because of the law, uh, because the penalty for skirting that law is pretty substantial for both the wrestler and for the the company. So, you know, that's why you don't see uh, some of the some of the Canadian stars. You know, you, you listed PCO. Kyle O'Reilly was a Canadian uh, right. you know, former Canadian world champion. Uh, same thing with Michael Elgin. Um, so over the years, we've had, you know, a number of Canadian talent. We use the Super Smash Brothers. Um, earlier in 2010 right. and 11, I believe. And then yeah. I, I called a couple of their matches in 2018 in Toronto. So, you know, we, we've, we've had them on occasion and, you know, sometimes the, the best way to use them is when we come to Toronto yeah. <laughs> and then have, have the wrestlers right. compete there, but it's, it's a difficult process. And even if you are the best pro wrestler in the world, there are cases and stories of, uh, people being declined, people, you know, by the U.S. government, you know, you can have the best lawyer, you can have the the biggest expert, you can have the, you know, you can have the best references. And sometimes the U.S. government just says no, you know, no, thank you. Um, so a lot of times it's out of the company's hands to bring in Canadian stars, even if they are some of the very best. But over the years, Ring of Honor's done, you know, done the best we can in terms of bringing the, the tip top, you know, Canadian wrestlers like Kyle. Um, at the time, Michael and you know it, Steve Carino doesn't really give <laughs> count. I'd say he'd been in the U.S. for quite some time by that <laughs> point. But you know there well, have been uh, great Canadian stars over the years. And signing PS, uh, PCO must have been easy because you can't be registered as a Canadian if you're not human, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, I I saw the reaction he got when he dropped the puck at the uh, at the Canadians game, and when they had him on the big screen. I mean, he's just, he's a, he's a living legend up there. I mean, it, for, that was one of the coolest moments in recent Ring of Honor history when, when he got to take the belt on the ice and then showing him on the crowd with the electricity graphics and just everything. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Exactly. Yeah, there's, a, uh, there's a really rich history in, in Montreal that's linked to the Rougeau brothers, obviously, and, and PCO has a history with them. So he, he is uh, thought very highly in that region of uh, Canada as well. Oh, definitely. Which is why I wanted to bring up that that summer supercard. Uh, I was there uh, in 2019 at uh, at Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, uh, th- three rows back from front, and one of the greatest shows I've ever attended. 
um not only did you know the, the card itself was amazing you, you you seen uh a very rare canadian uh appearance by marty skrull versus pj black you had the uh you had that ladder war between the briscoes and the, and the gorilla's destiny however i think the biggest pop of that night went to pco like that building was on fire for him do you remember anything about that show I do. I do. Uh, I remember I wore a purple velvet jacket. <laughs> I remember that as well because I, I, obviously you don't know this, I almost bumped into you. I walked oh, right yeah. past you and I was too nervous to say anything to you at all and almost walked straight into Caprice Coleman. <laughs> but I remember, But I remember your coat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I remember I wore purple that night and uh and I think, did I have the poppy on? No, that was November of the previous year when we were in, in the Maple Leaf Garden as well. Well, well. well, the show I'm talking about is the, uh, it was on SummerSlam weekend. Right, right, absolutely. And yeah, PCO, uh, I think they fought the kingdom that night, if I'm not mistaken. They uh, did, yeah. And uh, yeah, when they came out, it just a, a monster reaction, a great way to, to start the event. And yeah, he, I mean, he was red hot and it was... It was tricky to figure out, you know, how, to, you know, he was undeniable. He was somebody that the crowd wanted to see. And, you know, all the Ring of Honor fans were were really supportive of him chasing the world championship. And, you know, after he'd won the tag titles and the six man titles and the NWA tag titles and the Crockett Cup, you know, there was only pretty much one thing left for him to do. And to be the commentator for his journey was just amazing. But but that mm-hmm. night in particular, um, that ladder war was insane. Oh, and, I, and Jay Briscoe now has a scar that goes from his right shoulder to pretty much his left hip flexor. Uh, and I was the one that ran down and, and found our medic. <laughs> yeah, because he was, that was a brutal match. Yeah, he was in a bad way and we got him we got him medical attention and uh we made sure he was all right, but he just wanted to, he wanted to try and super glue it and <laughs> told him, no, <laughs> you can't do that. No, thank you. Jay, you got to see a medic. And uh, there was a curfew in the building and the parking lot where we were assigned to park and which Ring of Honor approved for parking closed at just about, I want to say a half hour within, within the end of the show. So we cut it real close because Jay was in my car of uh, getting locked in the parking lot, which is underneath oh, the grocery store. That's uh, right. <laughs> I've actually been locked in that parking lot before. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So I remember, yeah, I remember that night vividly. <laughs> before I throw it back to Tyler, uh, one more question about that show. The, uh, the championship match that night was Matt Taven versus Alex Shelley, where <laughs> very infamously a fan, and fell asleep in the front row and one of the performers used his stole his shoe to use as a weapon do you remember calling that i sure do yeah that <laughs> that poor guy was not having a great night and you know at the t- at the time you know ring of honor wasn't the most popular among fans on reddit or, or twitter or what have you and i remember just seeing it i remember i remember thinking is that is that guy all right and I, th- you know, I was buzzing back in my headset. Hey, I think we have somebody, somebody's got a medical episode. Like, I think somebody like, I thought maybe he had a seizure or passed out, you know, thankfully it was best case scenario where he just had too much to drink. Yeah. I ran into him earlier in the night, uh, at the merch station and he was all before the show even started and he was already wasted then. So when yeah. I saw him later that night, I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> I know what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, it's rare to say thank goodness somebody's drunk, but when the alternatives, <laughs> you know, when the alternatives are a medical episode, you know, I you start to be thankful, um, you know, and it's a shame because I really like I really like that match. You know, Alex Shelley is somebody that's still in the Ring of Honor orbit. You know, we just haven't found the, you know, we haven't found the right time because he is a physical therapist and mm. he keeps hours during the week. You know, there's there's a couple guys that you know in addition to wrestling have have other careers you know just because they can you know ring of honor schedule is great for that in a lot of ways because we mostly run on saturdays and sundays when we're running you know normally so you can you can keep a nine to five and and do really well 
And, uh, you know, Alex Shelley is a, a physical therapist and he's a guy that, you know, was fully intended to be in the pure tournament. Unfortunately, you know, his obligations to the physical therapy prevented him from being in the pure tournament. But he's a guy that remains friendly with with all of us. He does some impact stuff here and there. And I know, you know, if his schedule permits, the door is always open for him to come back in Ring of Honor. Uh, you know, just a, a living legend. And it's, you know, I know he's only 38 years old or, or, you know, I don't even think he's 40 yet. So, you know, legend is, a you know, kind of dates people, but he really is. He's really made his mark in one of the Absolutely. most creative wrestlers we've had. And uh, just a, a great guy that I'd love to see have a prolonged, you know, prolonged shot at the Ring of Honor World Championship. No, I couldn't agree more. Alex Shelley is definitely one of the cornerstones, especially in the early days of Ring of Honor. Uh, and you mentioned the World Championship. So, yeah, we were really excited uh, to have you join us. And, and leading up to you joining us, we ran a, a tournament on our Twitter uh, site to, to get the fans to vote in and our listeners to vote in and who they thought the greatest Ring of Honor World Champion of all time was. Uh, the finals came down to Samoa Joe and Nigel McGuinness with Samoa Joe taking the win. Who are some of, in your opinion, some of the most important champions in the history of the company? Ooh, um, you know, I think there's no bigger moment than Homicide winning the championship. For me, you know, winning the title, I think Homicide is probably the most underrated figure in Ring of Honor history. And to me, he's he's one of my favorites. He's a no-nonsense guy. Um, he had cool moves, but he always looked like he'd, he'd whoop you. Like, mm. there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, so Homicide for me is one of my favorites. Um, I always had a soft spot for Jerry Lynn. I yep. remember as a kid, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking four or five years old, I had my tonsils out and it was the first time I was ever in the hospital and they turned on the TV for me and it had ESPN and it was global. It was Jerry Lynn versus Lightning Kid who became mm -hmm. six or one, two, three kid or X-Pac. And I was, I was hooked and I started watching global from then, then out and, uh, you know, I didn't know he was Mr. JL and WCW. I just kind of <laughs> wondered where he went after a while. And then he turned up in ECW and then Ring of Honor. And uh, it was it's always cool to see Jerry. And, and uh, he was backstage a couple of times at Ring of Honor. So it was great to meet him. But, you know, those two are, are two of my favorite underrated guys. Um, and, you know, Ring of Honor for me has always been built on tag teams. You know, I think early on, the backseat boys didn't get enough credit. Yeah. Uh, Whitmer and Jacobs didn't get enough credit. Um, you know, there's a lot of teams from those early days. Uh, Reyes and Romero. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they had a pit bulls, right? Yeah. So, you know, those are guys that I look to that were just really solid as a rock that you could depend on and really just, you know, were the foundational pieces. And uh, But for world champions, I really like Homicide. I really like Jerry Lynn. Um, they could have matches with anybody. And uh, they were... It's going to sound crazy. They both of them always felt like underdogs as champions, which mm -hmm. adds an interesting element because you feel like the title can can change at any time. Oh, those are great answers, Jane. Uh, and you mentioned a lot of great names from the the past. There, those are those are some good stuff. You know, we'd spend a lot of time talking about Ring of Honor, but I, I kind of want to talk about you a little bit. And uh, agreed. You know, just uh, how did you get started in the world of professional wrestling? Oh well, it's something that I always wanted to do. Um, it was, you know, I was probably two or three years old and I got my first action figures. Um, I had some of the big rubber ones, the LJNs from my neighbors, mm -hmm. and they gave them to me. And I saw the Hasbros as they started to hit the store shelves. And I remember actually I got the Galoob WCW figures around the same time. And I was just I was just enamored and the action figures, I think, made me more of a fan of wrestling than sometimes actually watching wrestling because you could be creative and they were colorful and uh, they were just awesome to play with. And I remember, you know, my mom says I used to just sit in my room and just just call wrestling matches for hours. And it was something that, you know, I I, I thought I maybe wanted to be a wrestler. I was always kind of a bigger kid. Um, you know, I always played sports. And as I became a teenager, I, I did some some film stuff at the Wild Simone's Training Center with my buddy Chris. And I took one, you know, one back bump and I had the wind knocked out of me. And I said, you know what, <laughs> That's all right. I think I'm going to be an announcer. And uh, so I went to school for broadcasting and 
finished my degree at NYU, did some local TV, some public access stuff on Service Electric in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and then Phillies Nation TV uh, again on Service Electric, and then we got picked up on cable. So all of a sudden, uh, I had this little TV show that I was writing for and, and doing segments for that, that was suddenly on cable television. And we started to up the production a little bit, and we started getting better guests, and I had the Blue Meanie on. And I, you know, we, he said, Hey, why don't we go down to the monster factory for, uh, for a better setting? There's a ring and, you know, we can goof around, do whatever you want. And so we did that. And then I met Danny Cage and Larry Sharp and I kept in contact with Danny. And I said, Danny, uh, what if my friend wants to become a wrestling broadcaster? And he said, well, your friend should, should do the following. Your friend should show up at the next event with a suit, but don't wear the suit. You're going to come. You're going to set up chairs. You're going to set up the ring. I'm going to teach you how to break down and set up the ring. You're going to do concessions. You're going to do the door. You're going to do, and you're going to do everything. You're going to learn this inside and out. And when you're ready, you can start to call wrestling matches. And I said, but Danny, it's my friend. He goes, I know your friend is just get there, <laughs> show up at, show up at noon. <laughs> so, get your suit and get over here. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I started out sort of as the backup ring announcer at the monster factory and I started to do ring announcing when our regular ring announcer just stopped showing up, which happens more than you'd think in wrestling. Um, you know, even at a level where, you know, Monster Factory put out DVDs and now they stream and they do all this stuff. Uh, but even at that level, you know, people just don't show up one day. And so I did that. And uh, Kevin Kelly came in for a seminar for the wrestlers on how to talk and communicate. And Danny had me stand up and Kevin said, uh, hey, guy in the suit, what are you doing? Uh, can you sell me the event tonight in less than a minute? And I did. And uh, yeah, from there on, I was invited to to Ring of Honor events. And in about three years after that, I became the uh, the lead announcer. So that's that's how I got to Ring of Honor <laughs> in about sixty seconds. Well, that's fantastic. That's a great story too. And the Blue Meanie is uh, he's one of my personal favorites. So uh, you hear nothing but great stories about Meanie all the time. Um, and- you mentioned you mentioned another name there that I want to talk about, and that's Kevin Kelly. How helpful was Kevin Kelly in, in getting you to transition into Ring of Honor and making you feel comfortable enough to eventually take over in that lead announcing role? Yeah, Kevin Kevin was very generous with his time. Um, Kevin would send me notes and and pointers on different things, and you know I remember the one of the first matches I'd, I'd sent him was actually Matt Riddle versus Damian Priest. Um, you know, it's and who would have thought, you know, a couple of years later where we'd all be in different places. Okay. But yeah, so I mean, he would, you know, he'd respond and, um, you know, it eventually got to the point where he just said, hey, in order to get better, you're, you're going to have to just do this more. So he had some New Japan dates lined up and, you know, he met with our executive producer and they said, sure, you know, Ian's good enough. Ian's as good as he's going to get without doing more so we got to find ways to do more and then as his new japan date started to to, to kind of line up and conflict with ring of honor dates that's when i started to take on a, a big part of the workload and you know for him it was just checking in and you know just reminding me that that wrestling is an emotional thing and that the viewers at home want to feel something and you know giving me different ways to help them feel something and that can be as simple as, uh, you know, not, you know, not saying a word when a big moment happens to just kind of let it, let it breathe and let the crowd at home register what's happening. Um, you know, or it can be on the seat of your pants excitement with every near fall. You know, that's, that's something with Dragon Lee and with Jonathan Gresham with this technical wrestling. Uh, I make it a point to try and call every single hold or every single transition Jonathan Gresham has. So, You know, those are just things that that Kevin helped me learn Um, really to be a, you know, a better TV announcer. I got to give a lot of credit to our executive producer, Delirious, and to Mark Brown, who's our director. Um, You know, those are guys that have been with me now and helped me grow for four years. And, you know, Kevin got me on the right path, but both of them have gotten me better. And, you know, they've been they've been with me since, you know, since I became the lead announcer. And, you know, Mark is directed everything his first event as the director i believe was my first event as the lead commentator and so we've grown together and he's done everything from all in to madison square garden to to present 
that's um you know that's that's a great stuff and i i love hearing i love hearing the the behind the scenes people that don't usually get the recognition get those shout outs with mark brown and, and delirious um somebody that you did a lot of work with was uh colt cabana how fun was it to work with colt you know you guys got the uh the announcers of the year presented to you by bill after that must have been a really cool moment as well can you share some fun colt stories and and about uh, getting that award from bill yeah, yeah. Colt, Colt was uh, a, a lot of fun to call matches with. Um, he's somebody that he'll say something and, and you won't even realize just how good of a, a joke or comment it was until a couple of couple of seconds later. It's uh, that's how that's how smart and some of the, you know, some of the humor that he has. And it was always a, a fun time working with him. And, you know, I remember I remember pulling him aside in Baltimore in April 2017 and saying, you know, essentially, hey, I'm I'm the lead guy now. I don't have a partner. I'm like, and essentially, I know you like to wrestle, but I thought we had good chemistry at anniversary. What do you think? And it was like almost asking somebody out on a date. And and he, he kind of shrugged his shoulders. And he's like, let's, let's get through this TV taping first and let's see how it goes. Uh, and then it, it went all right. It went pretty well. So we went to Jimmy Seafood that night and we were waiting around. We, we sat together. And at one point he turns to me and he goes, well, well, who do I talk to if I want to do this with you? And so, you know, I thought that was very sweet. <laughs> it, was, it was like a, <laughs> like a courtship. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he wind and dined you. Yeah, yeah. And, and so after that, you know, it was, it was a blast. You know, the Bill After Award, that was, that was a thrill. I've known Bill for a couple of years. And you know, Bill and I lived maybe five, 10 minutes apart from one another in Pennsylvania for a long time for, for a couple of years. And so, you know, I used to go up to Bill's house and he used to, he would show me, you know, handwritten letters from Andy Kaufman and, and different things. And, you know, he's just, he's been there, seen it all. He showed me photos he can never print uh, that he took of Hulk Hogan with the championship the night wow. he beat the Iron Sheik. Um, and the, just for various reasons, they, they can't be printed. The magazines weren't welcome at the events at the time. And, uh, you know, but Bill, Bill managed to, to grab some photos that night. Uh, and he's just wealth of knowledge, super well respected. So to win, to win an award by a man of, of that stature and a man who really has, has been all around the world and, and seen it all and, uh, really knows what, you know, good wrestling is, it, it makes you feel validated. And, you know, I think you asked about funny stories with Colt. I think the funniest was in Las Vegas when I had been in San Diego for work earlier that day and I couldn't get a connecting flight. I, I couldn't get a flight from San Diego to Vegas. So I kept my original flights, which took me on a red eye from San Diego to Philadelphia. I then walked a couple of gates over and took a flight from Philadelphia to Vegas. And so <laughs> I just... I flown back and forth across the country. Um, I went to a room, uh, went to a production meeting, and then Colt came in later that night. Well, I got, I am a sleepwalker. I got up out of my sleep and I went to use the bathroom. I tried to leave the room and Colt gently said, Hey, Ian, I think Ian, go back to bed. So I just followed his voice and I climbed into bed with him. And <laughs> I told Cold had to gently roll me off the bed in my uh, in my full sleepwalk state. <laughs> <laughs> no, no nighttime story for you though, right? No, no. He, he could have a... his book. He had a couple of copies of his book with him, uh, <laughs> Resting Dreams. But I, I, yeah, no, no story that night. Well, just while we're on the topic of Cole Cabana, and then I want to throw it over to Mike for another question here. What was going through your mind when you got to TV and found out that you had to get into the ring and be in a tag team with Colt? Uh, that's crazy for you. And I got to say, you throw a hell of an elbow drop. Thank you. Um, that was years and years of, of doing it into the pool and uh, years of doing it onto the couch with the wrestling buddies. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's muscle memory at that point. You, you do it so much as a kid, you, you never forget. Um, <laughs> yeah, Colt had asked me, we were in England and he was like, you, you think you could do a big splash? And I was like, off the top. And he goes, no, just, you know, just run off the rope, bounce off the rope. Can you run the ropes? I go, yeah. Can you do a big splash? I'm like, I, I can't go forward. Like I can't, 
like I don't have a I can't do front bumps. You know, it's just I never got over never got over that fear. So he goes, all right, you think you do a leg drop? It's like off the top. And he's like, no, no, just off the ropes and do a leg drop. I'm like, yeah, probably. And I'm like, why are you asking? He's like, I got an idea. And I was like, well, if you're going to have me do a move, I'm coming off the top with an elbow. And he goes, he goes, yeah, right. You, no, no way. And I go, I, I, yeah, I could, I could do it. He goes, you ever do it before? No. <laughs> but I'm, like, <laughs> like, I'm like, that's, that's the one thing I had confidence that I could do. And it just, it literally is from being a kid and just emulating the macho man and, you know, just watching him do it and then doing it to the wrestling buddies. And so we got to the building that night and TK Orion, you know, helped me climb the ropes. And he, I I literally remember, you know, I did it to an empty mat off the second rope and he, TK led me up to the top rope. And he held my hand and he goes, just close your eyes, stand up straight and don't think about anything. Just he's, he just kind of had me meditate on the top rope. And he goes, you can do this. He's like, he's like, you're, you know, he was, he was a baseball player and he goes, you're a baseball player. Baseball players can do anything. And so I just kind of stood there and meditated and just standing straight on the top turnbuckle is one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. Um, it requires ridiculous balance and, you know, when you see guys do things from the top rope, it should be appreciated way more because I bet you nine out of 10 people cannot ma- even maintain their balance just on the top turnbuckle or the top ropes. So he just had me stand up there and then he goes, you want to try it? And I said, sure. And so somebody laid down for me. I forget who at this point, and it really bugs me that I forgot who it was. And it might've been Brian Johnson. And I, I jumped off and I did it. And I was like, oh, I can do this. And so Colt goes, Colt sees it, and he goes, you're ready. Don't do it again, or, or you, you'll you spook yourself. He goes, you did one, now you know you can do it, you know. <laughs> and then off we went. And then uh, poor Brian Johnson, that's the heaviest I've ever been. I was two, almost 240 pounds. And uh, <laughs> poor Brian Johnson got the brunt of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's an awesome story that must have been a thrill for you to get in there mike you got something you want to ask for ian well, i've got so much uh, i got to prior prioritize my questions at this point while we're uh, we're running along um first of all uh since you brought up bill after i'm going i i'm going to pl- do a cheap plug for the show please fans do not miss next week we will have bill after on this show which is crazy um ian you have ties to a lot of our guests this week you have ties to bill after who's coming on next week and you have ties to last week's guest who was uh, mike herman um uh, mike herman of course is the creator of retro mania wrestling um the sequel to WrestleFest. tell me tell me Ian, uh, how do you get involved in that game what was it like to do commentating for a video game finally yeah, it's really neat, and uh, I, I've seen the physical the uh, the physical box for the Switch release, and it blew my mind. I'm on I'm, I'm on the back cover, so nice. I I just can't even believe it. Um, Cole, you're also in in the mid screens, if I'm not uh, in the loading screens, if I'm not mistaken. I think Mike said that. I'm yeah, I'm in the loading screens, and I'm on the the kill screen. If you win the title, <laughs> I'm on the yeah. kill screen. It's <laughs> pretty crazy. Uh, I'm in the mean gene position from WrestleFest. Um, yeah, I, I can't believe it. Um, Colt, we were driving. I remember where we were. We were at, at uh, it was 2019. It was uh, Villa Park, Illinois, Chicago, a Chicago area. Uh, War of the Worlds 2019. And we're pulling in and he goes, hey, is it okay if I give your name to a guy named Mike? And I said, yeah, of course. He goes, all right, I'm going to give you your number and your email. And I go, uh, what's it about? He goes, he's doing this video game and it seems legit. And I go, okay. He goes, yeah, the Road Warriors are signed for it. Go, That's cool. And uh, he goes, yeah, and he's looking for commentators. He asked if I, if, you know, if I could put, you know, you in touch with him. And so pretty much the next day or so, I got an email from Mike. And he, you know, paid me very generously. And, and that's what I, you know, that's one of the things that's not real publicized. Um, you know, Mike sent me a cashier's check in a FedEx envelope two days after we agreed upon the agreement. You know, this was... Um, you know, not something, you know, a lot of times in wrestling, you hear these horror stories of, you know, oh, you know, somebody said they're going to pay me this and they didn't. 
Um, before I did any of the work, Mike paid me up front for all of it. And so, you know, just a, a great upstanding guy. And, you know, from there, within about a week, I, I, you know, did all of the commentary, the first run, as they made edits to the game. And as they added animations and characters, I added, you know, more, you know, Cardona and Myers were uh, late additions to the game. I added a couple of things for, for them. And added a couple of things for Jeff Cobb and Chris Bay, uh, who is one of the downloadable guys you can download soon. So, you know, for me, uh, it was a quick process. Mike's a great dude. He's a man of his word. He's transparent. Um, and, you know, the project is awesome because I used to play WrestleFest. At, there's a laundromat uh, by my house in Allentown. Uh, and before we got uh, a washer and a dryer when I was a kid. Um, you know, we used to go do laundry there and it was my favorite thing in the world because my mom would give me, you know, dollars worth of quarters and I got pretty decent after a while. So I could spend the full, you know, 45 minutes hour, uh, just playing WrestleFest and keep myself amused. And so it was a real good time playing that game and, and just, you know, seeing the characters, seeing the animations, uh, seeing the road warriors, it brought all kinds of memories back. And so, you know, I haven't played it yet. I know it's available for PC. I have it pre-ordered on Switch, and I'll be going to be buying it on PS4 when it comes out. But I am super excited. I'm th- I'm thrilled. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you know my mom and dad and my brother and my family has always been so supportive. It's one of those things I can can point to and say, "Hey, my, hey, look, my, I made it." You know, there was you know Madison Square Garden. You know, the selfie. Hey, look, mom and dad, I made it. Um, you know, there was all in with, with 10,000 people and I got to share that with my wife and my son. Um, but it's, you know, this is just another one of those things that just blows your mind because as a fan, you're, you know, you're like, oh, that'd be really, you know, that'd be cool to be be the wrestler in the game or to be Mean Gene. And then all these years later, you know, I'm the Mean Gene in the game. So it's pretty wild. No, that's definitely amazing. So um, hopefully one of these days in the future, maybe we, we can get you back on and I can ask the rest of my questions. Uh, but I'll go straight to my last question uh, before Tyler finishes us off. Uh, us off. Um, I personally believe, and I'm, I'm please don't think I'm kissing your ass because I'm not, I'm not saying this because uh, you're on the show. I've been saying this for the last year on this podcast. I personally believe that uh, Ring of Honor, had the best product of 2020 i really do um coming back with the pure title uh after that whole uh, you know break was genius um i don't know who ha- who gets credit for that but whoever it is deserves a hell of a raise um but what i gotta ask you ian is you personally what do you think is it going to take to get more eyes on the ring of honor product obviously it's not the talent or the booking that's the problem what what is it going to take to get more people back on track with roh yeah it's 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 interesting um i think you know jim Cornette's mentioned this straight up that we have similar viewership numbers and some in some weeks higher viewership numbers than than nxt and we have comparable viewership numbers than aew um you know, it, it's not raw viewers that I think is the, the you know, the, the topic or the focus. Um, what we do find is that, you know, other organizations, they, you know, AEW, you know, people have fun with Chris Jericho and he says the demo god. Well, the demographics that AEW does get do generate a lot of online discussion and do generate uh, publicity in ways that's that's positive for for AEW, you know, and and that's undeniable. Right. I mean, our viewership Ring of Honors tends to skew a little bit older and we do, you know, in a lot of ways, whether we intend to or not cater to an audience that is older, that maybe has, you know, an, an idea of re- what wrestling is. And sometimes that's classified more as wrestling in the, you know, in the South. And it's kind of, you know, more of that mold. So that's always interesting when I when I get asked this question, because our viewership is similar, but, you know, AEW. I think anybody can see is, you know, had a great successful pay-per-view and uh, they're a lot of the topic of, of discussion. So I always find it interesting that our, our TV numbers are, are very comparable, um, you know, to NXT and, and AEW. I think what Ring of Honor should do and continue to do is just stay the course. Uh, I think we have a winning formula right now. And, you know, Colt, I'll go back to Colt, you know, Colt, relays the story of being a 20 year overnight sensation where 
it took him 20 years to finally get booked by New Japan. But once he got booked by New Japan, he was suddenly, uh, he started wrestling for Ring of Honor again. Then he went to AEW and, you know, he's on cable television every week and he would have been in, you know, the, the, the tag league, you know, there was a lot of opportunities and, and, and things that opened up. You know, even though the Cole Cabana we see now, maybe he's a little bit smarter. He's certainly in great physical shape. Uh, is pretty much the same cult that we've known for years. Um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, continuing to do what we do and being consistent and reliable. And that's one thing Ring of Honor has been, is just a consistent outlet for professional wrestling. So for me, you know, maybe invest in things that that people do talk about and enjoy. Trading cards are red hot right now. That would be you know, something to invest in. Um, you know, video games, we just talked about video games. I, you know, there's a, there's a market for those that can be done with the stars of Ring of Honor. The micro brawlers are red hot. You know, having a toy or an action figure certainly adds some legitimacy and some, you know, some credence to what you're doing. And, you know, I was blessed enough to get one myself. So it's pretty neat. Um, you know, just things like that, that legitimize you in the eyes of the fans. And, you know, for me, you know, Ring of Honor is on the right track. We We always will be. We always are. And, you know, it, there's definitely a better feeling than there was maybe, you know, maybe 2019, you know, we talked about, you know, with the fan being drunk and whatnot in Toronto, uh, and, and it just put a big target on our back because we weren't the most popular organization at the time. And, you know, it, it feels a lot different. It feels a lot better. And I think we're on the right track. And I think if we just continue to do what we do, I think the word will spread and, and I think, you know, some more eyes and, and some more vocal fans uh, might get on board. I think that's pretty well said. And and while we're on the topic of AEW here, you know, they, like you said, uh, they've been the hot topic as of late and they're working with all these other promotions. Is that something you'd like to see Ring of Honor get involved with? Because for me personally, I think it's kind of cool that Ring of Honor is just, like you said, staying to the course. But do you, do you think, do you see a future with Ring of Honor working with any other promotions? I mean, there's there's a lot of matches I, I personally would love to call, you know, AEW versus Ring of Honor, Ring of Honor versus Impact. Um, but right now, it's something where we've been able to, to cast our own identity and we have a very specific identity. And that's that's invaluable. And I, right now, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily trade it for the publicity that we'd have. Um, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'd love to do an all-in two, or I'd love to do some sort of Super Bowl of wrestling where, you know, there's there's a match featuring Impact and Ring of Honor and AEW and New Japan, All Japan, CMLL, NOAA, uh, you know, DDT, uh, you name it, AAA, uh, and just everybody, you know, just have, have a nice feature where, you know, a lot of the top stars come and, and wrestle. And I think that would be really neat, and I think that'd be a way to maintain sort of everything where there's a showcase for everybody you know but right now i think we you know as from aside from some select opportunities with our partners from new japan um you know we've had great representation on new japan strong with with brody king and with bateman and ray oris um you know we've had some representation in the pure tournament and whatnot over here uh with new japan you know other than some of those things i think right now uh we're in a good spot it, but Again, if, you know, if AEW showed up, you know, AEW talent showed up in Baltimore tomorrow, uh, it'd be really fun to call ROH versus AEW or Impact versus Ring of Honor or, uh, you know, you name it. <laughs> right? I, think, so, I think we can all agree that the, as a wrestling fan right now, there's no better time to be a wrestling fan between the, the fantastic product that's being put out across the board, right? Absolutely. So the last question I have for you, Ian, because you've been so generous with your time and I know you're a busy man. Um Madison Square Garden. How big of a can can you take us back into the building that night? Like I know you mentioned All In, which was another big night, but Madison Square Garden is the mecca of arenas. Can can you just try to put into words what that was like for you as a lifelong wrestling fan to get to call matches inside the most famous arena in the world? Yeah, that, absolutely. For me, it it was a dream come true. Um, I went to college at, at NYU in New York City. Uh, it's about geez 28 blocks away and you know it was always a, a place that 
loom large. You know, there's so many acts and concerts and basketball games and hockey games that I wish I could have gone to. But at the time, you, you just can't afford it. And uh, while I was there, I made it to one Bruce Springsteen concert. I saved literally for months um, because, you know, I, I played baseball. I didn't have much time to work. And when I did, it was work study and you don't get paid much. And, you know, <laughs> so you, you got to eat, unfortunately. <laughs> Food costs money. So I saved up for one Bruce Springsteen concert. And that was the only time I'd been to the garden. And it was awesome. I had a blast. And uh, I was super excited because it was the first time since 1960 that any non WWE group ran Madison square garden. So almost 60 years. And, uh, you know, for Kevin, it was just another day at the office. He'd done the garden a couple of times yeah. he'd done a raw from there. Uh, and he'd done the Tokyo dome. But for me, you know, being a, a kid from Allentown who, you know, Madison square garden is, is 90 minutes away. Uh, it's always the biggest arena. It's the world's most famous arena. It was unreal. And, you know, being let in, you know, the, you know, the quote unquote athletes entrance, um, you know, thinking back to just kind of how, you know, how poor I was in college and, you know, just wondering if I'd ever see anything and then getting to see Bruce and then, you know, really you know, not being able to buy any drinks or merchandise or anything like that. And, you know, having literally to wait until I got back to my dorm room to eat you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And just to think about that to getting paid to call this huge event with, you know, Matt Tatum winning the world title, Okada winning the IWGP heavyweight championship. Uh, I just, it just blew my mind and it's still unreal. And my only regret is that I didn't take enough pictures. I took a lot and there's a lot I won't post online just because they're, they're personal and um, they mean a lot to me. And, you know, I took them to have them to remember the day by, um, but, but yeah, they, I think the most interesting thing was going the night before to, I went to network on Broadway and the star was Brian Cranston. <laughs> and okay. the reason I got there was, was Carrie Silken, uh, who's a Broadway ticket broker, uh, had these network tickets that he couldn't get rid of. And so at the new Japan press conference and, and the ring of honor press conference, um, after Okada spoke and after Jay White spoke. He pulls me aside. He goes, what's your email? And it's, you know, I give him my email. He goes, all right, listen, I gave you some, they're, they're, they're horrible. They're bad tickets. They're in your email. Uh, Ginley, Ginley's our sound guy. Ginley's going to go with you and uh, have a good time tonight. And so I didn't look at him. He, and he, he goes, it's at seven o'clock. Just be sure to get there by six or get six thirty so that you can get to your seats. So we go and I don't open the seats until we're waiting to get in. Carrie had given us front row tickets. Wow. To network. And so, you know, there I am with, with Ryan Ginley, one of my favorite guys in the Ring of Honor crew. And we're, we watch Network and it was awesome. And then I, I couldn't sleep that night, not because of nerves, but I must have got a stomach bug while I was at Network. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> before the event, um, I was pumping Pedialyte. I was uh, drinking water. I was just trying to eat and keep my stomach still. And, uh, you know, it's still debatable whether it was a flu or whether it was just nerves. I was that nervous. But, you know, I remember that. And uh, I remember the bus ride there. Old Town Road had just hit number one out of nowhere on the billboard charts. So Cheeseburger was blasting that on the on the bus. And uh, I remember almost I could tell you almost minute by minute what happened that day. And uh, it's just a day I'll never forget. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I, that moment when Muda walked out is a moment that I'll never forget as a wrestling fan. I can only imagine what it was like in the building. Um, before we let you go, Ian, I just want to give one more quick plug to tune in on March the 26th for the 19th anniversary show where you can hear Ian call all the fantastic action of Ring of Honor. Please plug your social media for everybody, Ian, before we sign off here. Absolutely. It's it's at Ian Riccoboni on everything. Um, yeah, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you name it, uh, the YouTube, uh, Carrie Silk and I do a, a YouTube series called 55 and five, which is a series about the 1955 Parkhurst wrestling card set, which was released in Canada, um, which features a lot of, uh, a lot of hall of fame talent, but also some names, a lot of people forgot. And so we go one by one doing uh, five minute history lessons on each of the wrestlers. And it's a lot of fun. So that's, that's youtube.com slash Ian Riccoboni or 55 and 5.com. Uh, for all those videos 
they've just been a lot of fun to do. And uh, it's really broadened my horizons. And I've wa- learned a lot about Canadian wrestlers, especially ones that are kind of off the beaten path, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we, we have a rich history over here on, uh, in the north, and uh, we thank you for your time. Mike, do you want to take us home? Absolutely, I do. Again, once again, thank you so much, Ian. We were anticipating this uh, interview for so long. Uh, as you can tell, Tyler and I are both huge ROH fans, but we're also huge wrestling fans, which is why it was important for us to get you on the show, because you are a wrestling fans commentator so thank you for all the work that you've done for ROH uh, I appreciate that a lot yeah, I just uh, just doing my best right now and I've been fortunate to have great partners like Colt and now Caprice who I think right now is the best analyst in wrestling Caprice is doing a phenomenal job as well you guys are a great team um, we can't wait to hopefully uh, one of these days we can catch back up with you and, and talk more wrestling uh, we have so much more to talk about um, for now though uh, please like uh, Tyler said, do not miss the 19th anniversary show of Ring of Honor, uh, which also uh, coincides with the one-year anniversary of Counted Out. Um, on behalf of Tyler, on behalf of Ian Riccoboni, thank you guys for listening. We have been Counted Out. Cheers. <laughs>